Good morning, everyone. So today I'll be discussing alcohol septal ablation, but I have to touch upon uh, cardiomyopathies in order to discuss this topic. I have no disclosures. So the definition of cardiomyopathy is a group of disorders primarily affecting the myocardium and characterized by myocardial dysfunction that is not the result of coronary atherosclerosis, hypertension, valvular dysfunction, or pericardial abnormalities. There are certain classifications for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The first one is hypertrophic, which is, includes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then there's obstructive cardiomyopathy and obliterative. There's also dilated and restrictive. So this um, diagram is showing you here. You can see that there's a, what a normal heart looks like. For the dilated, you can see that the ventricles are enlarged. For hypertrophic, you have, see the septum is enlarged and the ventricles are stiffened. And with restrictive, you see that the ventricles are restricted, but not necessarily enlarged. So for the purpose of this talk, we'll be discussing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there are pathological changes are of muscular hypertrophy associated with fibrosis. The muscle fibers hypertrophy or enlarge, and there's myocardial disarray in some parts of the heart. The coronary arteries tend to be of larger caliber as well. So in this picture, it's showing um, here you have normal muscle structure. You see where their fibers are normal, nice, and orderly and organized. And over here, with the myocardial disarray, you see that the fibers are all over the place. There's no organization. Again, this is just a depiction of a normal heart. You can see the ventricles are normal, the septum is normal. And in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the septums are extremely large. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy findings, you have dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, at least less than 30 millimeters, but usually greater than, uh, greater than 30 millimeters, but usually greater than 50 millimeters. And I'll show you what I mean with that a little later in the uh, presentation. For diastolic dysfunction, uh, can result in the development of atrial arrhythmias, such as AFib, ventricular arrhythmias, such as VTAC, VFib, chest pain, and sudden cardiac death, which is rare, but if it does occur, it usually occurs with, um, during vigorous physical activity. We also have an MI, mitral regurge, and arrhythmias. So the routine lab work is generally normal. Chest x-ray may suggest left ventricular hypertrophy, but it also may be normal. The EKG can show left ventricular hypertrophy, but as well as a pseudo, what we call a pseudo infarct pattern, where you have Q waves in the anterolateral leads, despite the absence of coronary artery disease. So again, over here on the left, we see the size of a normal heart. And on the right, you have the size of a heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see the difference. So echocardiograms should be the primary mo imaging modality when diagnosing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They can evaluate the septal thickness, the location and pattern of hypertrophy, the site and degree of the LVOT obstruction, and the continuous wave Doppler imaging can differentiate patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from those with fixed obstructions such as valvular aortic stenosis. So here is just showing that how patients may present with cardiomyopathy. They may come in with dyspnea, syncope, angina. They may be asymptomatic, and they may come in with just sudden death. So if you have a patient that comes in with sudden death, it's something to consider that they may have had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there's invasive treatment, one of which would be ICD, which is reserved for high-risk patients. It's basically for primary prevention and the, to prevent sudden cardiac death. You have a dual demand uh, pacemaker, which um, is supposed to offset the um, conduction of the heart. And it's not really a primary prevention, it's usually as an adjunct therapy. There's also alcohol septal ablation, which is minimally invasive, and surgical septal myectomy. So with surgical septal myectomy, it's actually open heart surgery and requires the use of a cardiopulmonary bypass lung machine to rest the heart. And this allows the heart to stop pumping so that the surgeon can actually resect a small portion of the septum through the aorta. And um, here on the bottom, you can see it actually, they're cutting away a piece of the septum. In alcohol septal ablation, it's a non-surgical, minimally invasive technique for septal myocardial reduction that provides dramatic hemodynamic improvement. There's a controlled myocardial infarction of the basal ventricular septum to decrease the gradient, and the septal artery is occluded with a balloon catheter, and alcohol is injected distally. 
So some of the indications for alcohol septal ablation include symptomatic patients with a New York Heart State Association class of three or four. So these are patients that are extremely symptomatic with minimal exertion. They're drug resistant to angina. They have syncope. The resting left ventricular outflow tract gradient is greater than or equal to 40. And the provoked left ventricular outflow tract gradient is greater than or equal to 60. And again, I will show you that later on in this presentation. The basal septal thickness is greater than 15 millimeters. So alcohol septal ablation was first introduced in 1994 by Dr. Ulrich Sigwart as a less invasive alternative to surgical septal myectomy. It originally targeted to, to a population of symptomatic patients who were thought to be poor surgical candidates but still needed symptom relief. The procedure has undergone significant technical refinements, most notable of which is the introduction of myocardial contrast echocardiographic localization of the target area. It's performed percutaneously in the cath lab Arterial access is obtained, and the coronary angiogram is performed to define the septal artery and to exclude severe coronary artery disease. Hemodynamics are reevaluated along with remeasurement of the intracavitary gradient. So, for pre hemodynamics, the simultaneous pressure measurements are performed in the left ventricle and in the aorta. A physiologic provocation of the gradient is then assessed with the Valsalva maneuver, so we ask the patient to cough. And we check the broken bro sign by inducing a ventricular extrasystole. So, when we say the broken bro sign, it's an absolute decrease in the pulse pressure of the beat immediately following the premature beat. So about two weeks ago, we um, did a patient, an alcohol septal, ablation, actual alcohol septal ablation on a patient, and these were actually her hemodynamics. So here, the white is the left ventricular, and the red is the aorta. So when we talk about the gradient, we're measuring the difference between the peak systolic, left ventricular systolic pressure, and the, the peak arterial systolic this pressure. And here you can see it's about 130 to 140. And this slide is depicting the Brockenbro sign. So you can see the PVC up here and the beat following preceding after. You can see the LV systolic pressure increased. The difference between the gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta also increased, but the aortic pressure decreased. So a venous access is obtained for temporary venous pacing in the event that the patient should go into complete heart block. An echocardiograph is performed with contrast to visualize the perfusion area prior to the alcohol injection. So the echo attending is in the room with us while we're doing the procedure, and they are performing an echo at the same exact time that we're doing the procedure. Once the target area is defined, a slow injection of a 100% alcohol is injected through the catheter. The high concentration of alcohol is delivered directly to the thickened heart muscle and left in place for several minutes, but no more than five minutes. The effect of the controlled cell, cell death at the targeted location is immediate, as thin scar tissue starts to improve blood flow to and away from the heart. So this, again, is just depicting where we have the balloon catheter here, and the alcohol is going distally. And this area is the area where the alcohol-induced infarction will occur. So individual studies have suggested that alcohol ablation may be useful in patients with no resting gradient, but a provocable gradient of greater than or equal to 30 millimeters. Some patients who do not show initial benefit can respond late and develop the reduced gradient at three months. So here is showing the LVOT gradients. Here initially, the top is uh, prov provoked and the bottom is resting. Initially, you can see they're quite high, but immediately after, you see a significant drop in the um, gradients and uh, alpha track gradients, and they continue to decline two years out. Again, here we have the New York Heart Association and the Can Canadian Cardiovascular Society class. At baseline, they were significant, so this patient was not really able to function at all. And a year later, there's a significant drop again. So potential complications are a complete heart block requiring a pacemaker, which occurs in about 14 to 25 percent of patients. A left bundle branch block or a first degree AV block prior to the procedure are significant predictors. The benefits of alcohol septal ablation are not diminished in patients who experience complete heart block. They still receive some benefit from this procedure. Other complications include ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac dissection, coronary dissection, pericardial effusion, and rarely late MI due to the escape of ethanol from the target vessel. 
But here at Mount Sinai, due to our extreme care in selecting of patients and adherence to strict protocol, over the past three years, we had a zero complication rate. So the advantages of alcohol septal ablation are the avoidance of a sternotomy and cardiopulmonary bypass and their associated risk. There's a shorter hospital stay and recovery time. For older patients, there's a less risk of stroke with alcohol septal ablation than with a septal myectomy, and it's also less costly. So this is our patient that we uh, did the septal alcohol ablation on two weeks ago. And this is just depicting, we're getting a picture of the anatomy, and we're trying to define the septums that we want to engage. Here, I want you to focus here because you can see the balloon is in the correct septal. Let me just take a picture to make sure that that's where we want it to be. Here, the balloon, we have it inflated, and you see the septals below it? That's the targeted area where we want the alcohol to go. Right now, we're injecting contrast, so we can see that what, where we want to go, and we also notice that there's no backflow. So when we do inject the alcohol, the alcohol will not go back to any of the arteries where we don't want it to go. It will just go directly to the area that we just defined. And then this picture I just wanted to show you that this is after the alcohol septal ablation and you can see the area below is no longer there. So this was successful. And then this picture is just the balloon is out, the wire is out, and you can see here the septal area, there's nothing below it. So the alcohol septal ablation was successful. And this is the same patients. These are their post-procedure hemodynamics. And you can see again here, the gradient has significantly decreased. And this is also the Brock and Brough as well. And it's still significantly decreased gradient. And this is the resting gradient. And again, significantly decreased. So there was improvement in symptoms immediately. So in conclusion, alcohol septal ablation has developed as a safe and attractive modality to treat patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The procedure has been refined over the past decade with steadily increasing outcomes. And when compared to surgical septomyectomy, the benefits of alcohol septal ablation inc include shorter hospital stay, less pain, and the avoidance of complications associated with surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so the first question is true or false. Alcohol septal ablation is a non-surgical, minimally invasive technique for septal myocardial reduction that provides dramatic hemodynamic improvement. Very good, excellent, I like it. Okay, the second question is what percentage, what is the percentage of high concentration of the alcohol injected? 10%, 30%, 100%, or 75%? <laughs> Yay, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, well, thank you, everyone, good job. <laughs>